With almost three weeks away from the trade deadline, the Indiana Pacers dropped their first huge bomb that sent shockwaves in the East. In a three-way trade, the Pacers grabbed the two-time All-Star Pascal Siakam, along with a 2024 second-round pick by the Pelicans. Meanwhile, the Raptors received Bruce Brown, Jordan Nuora, Kira Lewis Jr. from the Pelicans, a trove of first-round picks next year, and a 2026 first-round pick in return. After years of playing it safe, the Pacers finally go all in this time around to land a big star with big time credentials. At first glance, the addition of Siakam looks like a major upgrade for them, and his fit with Tyrese Halliburton and Miles Turner seems to be just fine on paper. But the big question now is, does Pascal Siakam move the needle for the Pacers? Now before we jump right in, let's dial things back a bit and talk about how Siakam got here in the first place. Drafted 27th overall by the Raptors in the 2016 draft, Siakam didn't see enough floor action in his first two seasons in the NBA, with DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry still at their primes trying to put the Raptors over the hump. But after years of desperately trying, they switched DeRozan for Kawhi Leonard, and this big changeup has opened up opportunities for Siakam to climb the ranks as the team's secondary scorer, while Lowry takes a back seat, embracing the leader role for the team. The lethal combo of Leonard, Siakam, and Lowry paid dividends from them quickly as they won it all back in 2019, and in the next 5 seasons, Siakam's numbers have grown steadily across the board as the Raptors pivoted to him as the next star of the franchise post Kawhi. And not only his numbers grew during that stretch, but he also expanded his trophy case as well. Cause aside from being an NBA champion, Siakam has also picked up a decent amount of accolades and recognitions along the way to solidify himself as one of the most versatile young talents in the league. But in spite of all this, the Raptors think that he's not the type of number one guy who could lead them to the top, which is why they decide to build around the well-rounded and much younger Scotty Barnes, thus making Siakam a disposable asset that could be exchanged for potential future pieces, and that's how he got booted and shipped out to Indy. Anyway, it totally makes sense why Indiana didn't hesitate to pounce on Siakam. The Pacers are riding at an all-time offensive wave that Tyrese Halliburton is currently unleashing, and it would be such a waste if they just watch it pass by without someone riding along that scoring wave. And by trading for Siakam, the Pacers think that he is the right guy to hold and man one of the surfboards. As of this recording, the Pacers are tightly cushioned in the 7th spot in the East, with a 24-17 record, and are breaking the NBA offensively right now by topping a bunch of offensive stat categories, which come as a bit of a surprise from a team that is kinda in the middle of their rebuilding phase. Now, where does Siakam fit in all of this? Well, to begin, Siakam is a really good scorer, averaging 22.2 points a ball game this season and a huge chunk of his buckets come from the open court, which is the main scoring area where he's comfortable dealing damage most. 14-9, to nine, they've hit six of their opening seven. Harden has it dislodged. Two on one, Siakam the other way. Glides by Green. You play him next to the best transition guard in the NBA right now, and you got yourself a well-oiled two-man machine on fast break, running at breakneck pace. Cause Halliburton's elite vision will surely find Siakam, whether it be on runouts as a secondary trailer. Pascal Siakam on the run. He attacks Booker, left hand. In the situation he was in. And wait for the next one. Yeah. Charlotte, they've dropped seven in a row. And, and as a team that puts a lot of premium on early offense, adding Siakam into the mix gives opposing teams another body to worry about, because he's extremely dangerous when defenses aren't set, as it allows him to not only get a beeline drive to the cup, but also get good position in the block and find mismatches that he can take advantage of. Now, during his time in Toronto, opposing teams would often shrink the floor whenever Siakam was operating on his sweet spots, so that double teams could come easily to stop him. Well, that's not going to be the case with his new squad, cause coming from a team that is ranked 23rd in 3 pointers made and 18th in terms of 3 point percentage, Siakam wouldn't get clogged in the lane that much anymore, since the Pacers are 6th right now in 3 pointers made, while hitting 38.1 from 3 as a unit, which ranks 5th in the league. Walker, Matherin, Heald, Halliburton, Toppin, Neesmith, and Jalen Smith all shoot above 35% this season from range. 
With Siakam's ability to go downhill and slice his way inside the lane, it puts the defense on a tight spot since they can't throw extra bodies to the diving Siakam, cause he's surrounded with a plethora of great shooters now, and he'll just spray it out once he got into trouble. And that's also one thing that people tend to overlook in his game. I mean, aside from putting buckets on the board, Siakam can also facilitate when such a situation arises. This makes him a double-edged sword type of player, with a pointy tip on each end as he can create shots for himself and set the table up for his teammates as well. It doesn't lie. <laughs> Siakam now. Lead pass it to us. Pascal. Hesitation, drive, kick, corner three. Lagging behind with a 26th ranked defensive rating, the Pacers can definitely benefit from a long and rangy guy like Siakam on the defensive end. At 6'8", with a pterodactylish wingspan of 7'3", Siakam plays bigger than his actual size. He's an active, long defender who can clamp multiple positions at the point of attack, or an off-ball help, and his imposing strength alone is enough to bother lane penetrators. Not to mention that he's also great at timing and anticipating the shot release of the player he's up against. Spicy dude. He'd have won three straight. One last night at home against the Clippers. Butler denied, stays with it, denied again. Cut off by Young. Up top, RJ, the block. Here's the Adams. Now, so far, the only downside of his game is his lukewarm three-point shooting. He only shot 32.4% last season, with the career best of 36.9. The Pacers run a high-octane offense that is predicated floor spacing and constant people movement. Siakam eventually has to learn to shoot consistently from deep if he wants to keep in pace with them, but on the flip side, the need to improve is not yet necessary for the meantime. Cause there's nothing wrong if he would just focus on attacking inside and score on the break as he can still be as lethal by kicking the ball out on penetrations instead of trying to be a volume 3 point shooter with uncertain results. After years of retooling, the Pacers are now poised to make a run deep in the East with the addition of Siakam. But the next question is, does the risk of surrendering their future assets in exchange for Siakam is going to pay off? And I mean that in a literal sense. Siakam is in the last year of his $136.9 million max extension, which he signed back in 2019. The deal didn't include a player or team option, which means that there is a possibility that he'll be an unrestricted free agent next season, if Indiana doesn't pay him by the end of the season. As per multiple reports, the Pacers have confidence they can re-sign Pascal Siakam during the offseason. But if Siakam decides to sign elsewhere for a bigger payout, then this trade would amount to nothing. The Pacers are onto something big now that they have Siakam. It's not the type of a needle mover that shakes the core of the league, but it does cause some slight tremors to the teams they will potentially face in the East come playoff time.